Thank you everyone for joining us uh, for the first SIP seminar of fall semester. Uh, we will now uh, get started uh, with our first seminar. It's a pleasure to have Professor Amin Wei uh, join us for the first se seminar. Uh, Ermin uh, is an assistant professor in, at Northwestern University in the departments of Electrical and Computer Engineering and Industrial Engineering and Management Sciences. She did her PhD from uh, MIT, uh, and uh, she also has uh, triple undergraduate degrees in computer engineering, finance, and mathematics, including a minor in German. And she has received many awards, uh, including the Graduate Women of Excellence Award, uh, second place prize in Ernest A. Gwilman Thesis Award, and uh, her team won the second place in the Go competition in 2019 and Electricity Grid Optimization Competition organized by Department of Energy. Ermin's research interests include distributed optimization methods, convex optimization methods, uh, and their applications to smart grids, communication systems, and energy networks. It's, it's uh, truly a pleasure to have her uh, join us and uh, give us uh, this seminar on robust and flexible distributed optimization algorithms for network systems. So with this, uh, I will hand it over to Ermin. I mean, all yours. Thank you for joining us. All right. Thank you. Thank you for the nice introduction and the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here to kick off the fall seminar series. And let's hope technology will behave and so things will go smoothly today. OK, so today I'm going to be talking about some of our recent development on distributed optimization algorithms. And as what he already said in the introduction, uh, I have a few other interesting topics that are ongoing. So if time allows, to, at the end, I will tell you a little bit about what other uh, interesting things are happening in the group. But uh, for the majority of uh, today's talk, we're going to be focusing on developing distributed uh, optimization algorithms. And the keywords on the title are robust and flexible. So we'll, I'll be more specific in what they mean later in the seminar. So the work is based on uh, joint the talk is based on joint work with my uh, recent graduate, uh, Fatame Mansouri. She's now, uh, she got her PhD and is now at BCG Consulting Group. And then uh, Hara Yakovito, who's uh, in her third year of uh, PhD. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. All right, so what is the setup? Why are we looking at distributed optimization? Uh, well, Today, uh, there are a lot of data out there. And uh, machine learning is uh, on a lot of people's minds, right? So, so all these um, availability of data, improvement in hardware, and uh, 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 readily available access to this hardware enables this new computing paradigm where we're talking about large scale networks um, of agents that can compute things, so large scale uh, cloud with lots of computer connected to each other, or uh, maybe you have a big sensor network that are collecting data and can process some of the data locally, but can also communicate with their neighbors, right? Um, so, or you may have a robotic network where you have lots of robots that can um, sense their environment around them and uh, communicate and collaboratively try to figure something out. So um, all of these, I'm going to model them as a network of agents. So these agents could be robots, sensors, or computers. And they have uh, ability to collect local information. And they have some local information available to them. And then they have some local processing power, so some basic uh, computation power available there. Excuse me. And then they can communicate with uh, each other that are close enough or in some other measure. So some examples are, are what we've already talked about a few of these. So the computer clusters, a lot, we can talk about a high performance computing setup where you have lots of uh, these uh, computer cores connected to each other. And I have an example here on the slide that's the Arba National Lab, uh, a high performance computing lab. And then we can also have wireless communication networks. So you, your cell phone is a pretty powerful device in terms of computation capability and obviously can communicate with Space station, cell phone towers, and the other cell phones, right? Um, and then we have these uh, multi-agent robotics 
set up here. Either they can be flying around the drones or they can be uh, driving on the in a corridor here in the probably a university setting here. Uh, but the robots will have some capability to communicate and commu uh, compute locally. And then the last one is a uh, sensor network example. Okay, so, so all of these examples fall under this new computing paradigm where we have uh, lots of different devices out there that have local information, have local processing power, and can communicate with each other. Okay, so that's the setup that I will be in, and I will be developing algorithms for these different devices. So each of these systems will uh, be running local algorithms towards some global uh, solution or some global problem, and I'll introduce the problem in a bit. So um, overall, that's what we mean by distributed optimization. So we're trying to optimize some global objective with local information. Okay. All right. So uh, let me introduce a toy example here to motivate the setup. Okay. So this uh, is coming from machine learning uh, empirical loss minimization in particular. So uh, let's say we have a network of n sensors. So, so these uh, the big ones are the sensors that are here. The red lines are the uh, modeling the communication capability. So any of the two uh, green balls that are connected to each other, they can talk to each other. Okay. So let's just say we run a very, very simple machine learning test, supervised passive learning. Um, so let's say I am interested to figure out the electricity consumption of an average household as a function of the temperature. Um, so electricity is one of the fields that I'm also actively working in. So this probably was personally interesting for me to uh, learn the solution too. Okay, so let's say you have these smart meters in different neighborhoods that are collecting data. And let's just say they collect data on an hourly basis, okay? So that means each household generates uh, 8,000 data points a year. And then we can have lots of different households. And let's say I'm curious on in what an average household consumption looks like, or either that or an aggregate consumption that kind of look like. Okay, so, so I have these sensors collecting data and each household gives you 8,000 data points. And you can see quickly this how this scales and also the meters are capable of collecting data more frequently than every hour. Uh, typically the, for electricity, the updates happen every five minutes. So you multiply that by 12 and then multiply by the number of households. And uh, maybe you also have it over a whole year. So you can see very quickly that the data size can grow. And then, so each of these households, or sorry, each of the sensors will be collecting data based on temperature and consumption, okay? So uh, let me skip the one line. So that says the input is going to be T, output is going to be D. So T is the temperature, D is the demand that we're trying to predict or the consumption. Okay, so uh, for simplicity, let me assume I only have three sensors out there collecting data so I can plot them nicely with the visualization here. Right, and then, um, so this curve that I'm plotting here on the y-axis is the, the uh, consumption or the demand B, the X axis, the, the Y axis is the consumption, the X axis is the temperature. Okay, so you can see, um, for those of you who are curious, this is actual real data from New England ISO uh, about the consumption in the, uh, the, the Boston area. And uh, you can tell this curve has two tilted ends, um, uh, both when so, so the y axis, sorry, the keep messing up. The x axis is the temperature in Fahrenheit. So when you approach more than 100 degrees, it's super hot. That's when all the ACs uh, kick in, and you see the consumption of electricity picks up. And when uh, the temperature is below 30, that's when it's freezing cold, and uh, um, some of the heat turn on, and you also see the consumption pick up. But overall, since uh, a lot of the heating equipment are powered by gas, the uh, the tilt on the left is smaller compared to the AC, where all the ACs are uh, driven by electricity. So that's why it's shaped like this, okay? All right, so that's all nice. We have a nice intuition about the picture, but as far as the solving the problem is concerned, right? So we might wanna look at the picture and then decide, hey, this looks like we can fit either a quadratic or third degree polynomial. 
to explain this trend of temperature versus uh, the demand. Okay, so the different colors of the uh, markers on the picture corresponds to consumption collected at different points. So let's say we have one of the sensor who only knows about the uh, the blue ones, and one of the sensor only knows about the black one, and one of them only knows about the pink ones. Okay, so uh, each of the sensors only has access to its local data point. But collectively, we're trying to recover this um, polynomial overall, or this red curve that we're trying to fit. So we're trying to get a formula for the red curve. And let's say we looked at it, and based on our intuition and how it looks like, we decide a third degree polynomial is going to be good enough. OK? So well, how do we decide on a third degree polynomial? Well, we need to find these coefficients x3, x2, x1, and x0, right? So in some sense, we, we might have a lot of data, but in the end, we only need to figure out these uh, vector in R4. So there's just four scalars I need to figure out, x0, 1, 2, 3, okay? And that would give you a description of the curve. So uh, that, that gives you a sense of what kind of scaling we're talking about. The problem can be large, meaning the number of data points can be really, really large, right? So I'm just plotting a bunch here, but imagine you have 8,000 per household, lots of households and lots of sensors throughout the city. Um, but the value that you are interested in learning could be in a very low dimension. So in this case, it's in uh, four dimensional space. All right, so, so that's going to be the setting moving forward. X is in a low dimension. The data itself is huge. So that's why we don't want to communicate the data, the original raw data around. But it's OK to communicate something on the same scale as the, uh, uh, as the X around. So it's OK to pass Xs around. All right. And then um, so, so that was the picture illustration of what the problem we're trying to solve. And uh, mathematically, if you just want to do a simple least square here, then we can put all the temperature here into this A matrix, the feature matrix, and just list all the features and take the temperature to first, second, and third order, put them in a big matrix, multiply by x, which is the coefficients of the polynomial, and try to predict uh, what the demand will be. So uh, this A I transpose X gives you a prediction, minus D I gives you the prediction error, and we're going to take two norm squares. So we're just doing a regular least square problem. Okay. All right. So what's interesting here is you can imagine the centralized problem, meaning if you had access to all the data, you would have a, a really big matrix A. But here, since you uh, are getting data from different sensors, each of the sensors will have partial information. So um, the overall system is going to be a summation of, across these AI. So we're chopping the matrix into different parts and just add it up. OK? All right. So, so that's a toy example. But hopefully, that gives you a motivation for the um, problem setup later we're going to talk about, which um, essentially it's going to be looking like this. It's going to be a sum. So this summation sums over different agents. And then the, the objective function is going to be related to the local data points. And then this x is going to be global for all the agents. Okay, So common x, different objective functions, and they are going to be summed up. Okay, so that's the feature we're talking about. And let me show you another picture here. OK, so um, some of you may have heard the word federated learning. That's a, uh, a word coming from Google and recently has gained a lot of traction in the industry. So Google, Microsoft, and Amazon that, uh, are all having teams working on this. And it's essentially doing this machine learning type of problem we talked about uh, on the previous slide over a star graph. Meaning you have too many data, you don't want to, maybe it's just physically impossible, either that or uh, it's fast, or you want to take advantage to, uh, of the parallelism available. So you don't want to fit all data in one machine, but rather break it down to different pieces and have each of the machine uh, be responsible for one part of the problem. Okay, and then um, each of the machine would have a piece 
and then they would communicate with the cloud or some kind of aggregator to recover the global problem, right? So remember the problem on the previous slide had this form, summation over I, uh, Fi of X, and we're minimizing over X, okay? So that, so we're gonna extract that kind of formulation here and say, well, we can put this problem and distribute this onto different machines, okay? And so for instance, I have this star graph down here. There's an aggregator on top and then bunch of uh, different nodes on the bottom. So, um, and this is what people refer to as federated learning. It's just a, um, learning problem over a star graph. And what I'm gonna talk about today will be um, applicable to federated learning, but also more general graph topology. So I would just assume there is a connected graph among these agents. Um, so what are some interesting applications for federated learning, right? Okay, so we can think about cell phones and the cloud, right? So you have your iPhone uh, or Android or some, some phone. Uh, let's just stick with iPhone example. Let's say we have Siri on the phone that's trying to learn uh, this uh, voice to text or voice recognition, right? And uh, you want, you're speaking to Siri and it's transmitting some data back to the Amazon cloud, uh, sorry, Apple cloud. And then you, there are some issues, right? So. One is you probably don't want everything you say being transferred back to the cloud, right? So that motivates the distributed processing. That's why uh, it's useful to be able to run some local computation, right? So in the previous example, we're talking about the demand versus temperature. You don't, you may not want any agent to know exactly at every hour how much you consume because then they can infer things like if you're at home, what kind of places you have, et cetera. Uh, you might not want that. So instead, if they aggregated and only communicated these uh, uh, four uh, scalars around, that preserves your privacy in some sense. Okay. So I'm using the word privacy very loosely here. All right. And then on the uh, iPhone and the cloud case, you also don't want to send your data all the way back to the cloud all the time. But if they do some local processing and send some summary, maybe it's better and it's okay. Um, another thing related to the iPhone case is you don't want this communication or computation to take too much of your iPhone's battery power, right? You don't want to, every time you ask the real question, it drains the battery by 20%. <laughs> so, so you want to uh, want the algorithm, whatever Siri has running there, to be aware of the use case and to uh, not consume too much battery and not uh, really, or not leak your privacy too much, okay? And then we can also talk about the case uh, of machines connected in this uh, star fashion in the cloud. So sometimes you can get hours on the uh, Amazon Web Services, the Amazon Cloud, and you, they may be connected in this fashion. Maybe you have a big machine learning job to train and just send the data up to the cloud. And then the cloud configures itself, right? So they can run these local computations and then talk to the aggregator. So in that case, maybe the, uh, depending on what kind of setup they have, but remember in the very first slide, I had this picture of a high performance computing cluster where it's just uh, a you know, lots of machines with uh, different cores stacked up to each other. So these cores sometimes have shared memory, sometimes are physically connected. So it's very easy for them to talk to each other. But maybe the problem you're running is very high dimensional machine learning. And in order to train, you need to get the gradient. In order to get the gradient, you need to sample a lot of uh, times. And the stochastic sampling may be very expensive, right? So in that case, it's okay to communicate, but you don't want to run or obtain exact gradient too many times. Right? So that would be a different kind of setup. Um, all right, so let's keep these different setups in mind and uh, see what kind of uh, problem that we will run and uh, what kind of features we want to have for the solution. Okay, so Here's a mathematical formulation, I mean, representation of the formulation. Okay, so we have a network of N cooperative agents, so I'm not doing strategic one. There's no game theory in today's talk. 
Um, and I'm going to assume the graph itself is undirected. So I know um, some of the people in the audience have worked on directed graph, and those are also very interesting. But I'm going to stick with the easy case for today. It's going to be undirected, meaning uh, if I can talk to JJ, can also talk to I. So the communication goes back for, uh, both ways. And then the problem we're solving is the first one in red here. We're going to minimize x and n agents, so summation of fi of x. Again, x is common to all the agents and Fi's are particular to agent I, okay? And then we want to develop an algorithm where things are done, computation are done locally, and the communication only happens with, with their neighbors. Okay, so for instance, the graph down here, right? So I have uh, agent two can communicate with one, three, and five, but it cannot communicate with agent four, okay? Because they're not connected. So exactly how is this graph determined? I'm going to assume it's given, but uh, in reality, so for instance, we're working with robots. It could be a robot within certain range that they can talk to each other and also not blocked. Uh, so also have a line of sight. Uh, so, so in reality, it's pretty complicated. Uh, when, when you put an obstacle between the two robots, they lose the connection and then they have to move around and et cetera. But for today, the graph is determined. It's static, it's not changing, okay? So it's a nice case, all right? So how do we solve this problem? Well, one common trick is to introduce local copies, right? So the problem up there is a little hard because there is a uh, global variable coupling everyone. And uh, unless you have shared memory accessing, that one variable would be hard. So what we're gonna do is to introduce copies of this variable. So each of these xi live in the same dimension of x. It's not a component of x, but rather, so previously we were in R4, and then each of these xi would also be in R4, okay? So we're gonna introduce local copies and then solve the problem uh, for this one down here. So minimize summation of fi of xi. And since we introduced copy, we better make sure it's the same uh, we recover the same solution as before, right? So what we're going to do is to make sure um, any of the two connected neighbors agree on um, what their x is. Okay, so we're going to have this xi equal to xj for uh, ij in E. So E is a set of edges. And that's essentially saying for any i connected to j, we're going to make sure xi equal to xj. Okay, and we're going to assume the graph is connected. So if this happens for all the edges, then overall, uh, for all the agents in the graph, they agree on one value um, or one vector. And then uh, we would recover the original problem. Okay. All right. So, okay. So next, uh, some technical assumptions and uh, simplification here. So instead of writing xi equal to xj all the time, I'm going to introduce this uh, matrix shorthand notation, which is going to be ax equal to zero, where x is the vector, a long vector of all the xi stacked up, and a is this matrix essentially, uh, it's the adjacency matrix representing xi equal to xj. So it has one and minus ones at every edge. Uh, and if your x is in higher dimension, it has i identity and the negative identity at the i and j's column. Okay. All right, and uh, we are going to assume fi's are quite differentiable, strongly convex with the uh, Lipschitz gradient. So uh, I'm in a very nice setup here. And uh, I will later develop convergence guarantees with respect to these assumptions. And again, each of the agents knows only fi, and they will be in charge of updating xi's. And then um, I already talked about this uh, A. So, so from now on, I'm going to drop the xi equal to xj notation, but rather stick with the ax equal to zero notation for making sure um, the agents at, across an edge agree with each other. And this is also called the consensus constraint, meaning eventually we want to make sure uh, all the agents agree with each other. Okay. All right, so uh, this ax equal to zero part is, can also be interpreted as a consensus problem uh, for those of you who are familiar with that line of literature. Okay, so now let me, uh, before I tell you what our contributions are, let me first tell you what, the, what are some well-known approaches out there in the literature, okay? So uh, one, 
class of uh, algorithms is based on this consensus um, based algorithm and the name came from that constraint I was just talking about the AX equal to zero it's really referred to as a consensus constraint okay so what's the thinking there well let's uh, uh, go back to this problem right so the problem has two parts the objective function and the constraint the objective function is essentially a summation of local objectives. The constraint makes sure uh, all the axes equal to each other, especially in particular, make sure if i and j are connected, they are equal to each other, right? So what should an algorithm do? Well, it has two parts. One is to minimize the objective function. One is to make sure for all the edges connected, they are equal to each other, right? So let me talk about the second part first. If I want to make sure all the edges, uh, so all the agents that are connected equal to each other, then it's, uh, you, you can view that as somehow if I look at an agent and its neighborhood, meaning the agents connected to it, they better agree, right? So one way to do that is to say, hey, I'm going to take an average of my neighborhood and work towards that average. So if everyone does that, then uh, I will, uh, all the, Agents in the network will go towards the average of the uh, network in some sense. Okay, I'm, I'm waving my hand here. There's a very beautiful, uh, rigorous argument for why consensus algorithms work. But that, that's the intuition. I'm going to take an average with my neighbors to make sure eventually I can reach consensus. And then uh, on the objective front, I want to decrease the system objective. So what I can do, since I only know my own FI, is I'm going to take a gradient step with respect to local fi, okay? So that gives you the formula here in red. So uh, this W, the summation, this first part, is the consensus that it's taking a weighted average of your neighbors, uh, including yourself. So you look at the, uh, the neighborhood and uh, take a weighted average and uh, the WIJs are now negative. Uh, so the WI the diagonals are positive, and then the rest of the off diagonals ones are not negative. It has given only if the two agents are connected, so they can talk to each other. Okay, so this the first term represents a weighted average, and then the second term is essentially a gradient step or a gradient or subgradient, depending on if your problem is differentiable or not. So SK here is a step size. Okay. Again, this is the, the uh, I guess, pretty intuitive algorithm, right? So I'm going to go down in my gradient direction, decrease objective function, and then I'm going to average with my neighbors. So I just do these things in one step, and this is uh, called distributed gradient descent. Okay. And um, so the picture down there is the illustration of the information spreading. Okay. So what happens in the algorithm is every step, all the agents know its local objective, right? But uh, so at k iteration, the yellow node knows its own objective. And then when uh, you move from k to k plus one in the next iteration, during the update, this yellow node in the middle would have heard from the blue nodes to take a weighted average of its neighbors. Okay, so now the information, so the yellow node now knows the yellow part and also the blue part. And then uh, in another update, it's going to repeat the same thing, but the blue node in the previous update would have heard from all their neighbors, so it would have heard from the green node. And effectively, in two steps, this yellow node in the middle would have heard from two hop neighbors in the network. All right, and this is the, the essential process of how information spreads in the network. So every update you hear from one degree neighbors. And at the same time, they are also hearing from their neighbors. So in the next update, you're essentially hearing from your two degree neighbors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So eventually you hear from everybody in the network. And that if you uh if you're not convinced the I can reach average, so hopefully this convinces you at least you hear from everybody in the network eventually. Okay. All right, and if you are uh, curious about this, the consensus related to literature, I think I have uh, references up in a few slides. Okay, so so that is the simple approach of taking a gradient step and rounding a consensus of doing distributed gradient step. Now, uh, alternatively, there's another line of research here based on ADMM or other method multiplier kind of work. So um, 
I don't have time to go into details, but let me uh, to motivate the algorithm. And we have one of the uh, the expert on ABMM in Rutgers. So if you have questions on that, you can, I'll refer you to Professor Jonathan Exton. He knows all about ABMM. Uh, so essentially, I'll just give a high level summary here. This is a method that is uh, alternating between primal space and dual space. So the, uh, I guess the classic form of ADMM has two primal variables, X and Y, and they are in a separable objective function. So in each of the updates, you take a minimization with respect to augmented Lagrangian. So the, this is a regular Lagrangian plus a quadratic term here. Right, so the quadratic term penalizes for any violation of the constraint. And uh, any, so in the iteration of the algorithm, you first take a minimization step with respect to one variable fixing the other, and then use the updated variable to update the second variable. Okay, so you first fix y, minimize x, then you fix x, minimize y, and then you update the dual variable. So that's why it's called an altern alternating direction method of multiplier ADMM, because you alternate between X and Y, and then you do the dual update. Okay, so uh, I don't have time to go into detail, but this is also another popular method to be used to solve our distributed optimization problem. And believe me, you can massage the terms and I'm sorry, massage the objective function to somehow look like this, and you can divide the constraints accordingly. Okay, so, uh, what are the key takeaway on this slide? The, well, one is this is a good method. Uh, if you have a problem and you have the capability to solve minimization per iteration, then this would be a good method to try out, okay? And uh, what are the disadvantage of this method? Well, you need to do a minimization. Actually, you need to do two of them uh, in this, the way that I'm writing it here um, per iteration, okay? And that can be costly, right? Running, but minimization, so look at this minimization problem. It involves the augmented Lagrangian, which has F and G and the dual term and a quadratic term. So if the F function or G function are with, was hard to optimize in the beginning, then this minimization step may take a while to do as well. Slightly better because you have the quadratic penalty to make things strongly convex and uh, it's slightly nicer. But still you have to run a minimization all the way. Okay, so that can be costly. All right, so advantage of ADMM compared with what's on the previous slide, which is based on gradient, is the uh, arc mean type of methods are faster, but they're more expensive. Okay, all right. So uh, I have uh, the promised uh, reference of literature here. This is no way near inclusive. Uh, there are a lot of literature in the field and I'm uh, doing a, a very coarse attempt to break them into different categories. So there are some based on the primal uh, method. So they're based on taking gradient. So related to stochastic, sorry, related to distributed gradient design. And it started from the Bertikus uh, Stochastic kind of uh, work back in the 80s. And the whole consensus literature grew out of there. Um, and then there are these uh, dual based methods that either need a minimization or they do some kind of dual averaging or mirror descent or, or some other kind of operation in the dual space. Okay, so instead of running uh, descend in the primal space, they now are in the dual space. And if you we are talking about ADMM type of method, then there will be a minimization um, per step. Okay. And then there are Newton based methods, which uh, are more advanced and they are really fast, but they have pretty complex looking iteration. Okay. And then lastly, we have uh, uh, this asynchronous method, which says not all agents would have to update at the same time. So in a distributed setting, asynchronous methods are very desirable, uh, meaning you don't want to, because you have a large scale network and you don't want to force all the agents to wake up and do their update at the same time. So maybe you want, you have agents doing partial updates. Okay, so, so for, Today, uh, I'm mostly not going to talk about asynchronous uh, methods. I mean, we worked on this and we have a few publications out there. So if you're interested in asynchronous methods, I'd be happy to talk to you offline. Um, and actually, we have uh, a lot of local experts at Rutgers on distributed optimization methods. Um, so, you know, I think 
if we get the discussion started today and got the graduate students excited, we have a lot of collaboration potentials. Okay, so what I'm going to do though, I, I'm not gonna go through these uh, references in detail, but I will tell you what I want to do <laughs> and how that's different from most of the literature on the previous slide. Okay, so remember the title of the talk, there's two keywords that I highlighted, flexible and robust. Okay, so now let me be a little bit more specific. What does flexible mean? So we went over the example of this iPhone case, right? Where we don't want your phone to drain the battery and we don't want to leak all the data. Um, but it, it's okay to report the high level data every once in a while. And uh, uh, your machine is pretty powerful. So it can do pretty advanced computation on board. Okay, we also talked about the high performance computing example where the memory is shared, so communication is cheap, but the data, in order to get a gradient step, you may have to sample a lot of data and the computation can be expensive. So these two kind of set up what's called for very different type of algorithm, one where communication is cheap, one where computation is cheap. Okay, and uh, if you work with the, uh, engineers who develop robots, they will tell you it's not the communication or computation, it's the battery life that matters, right? So the, uh, the, you can, the robots can take their time to achieve the task, but you want to make sure they finish the task before the battery runs out. Okay, so, so how do we combine all these different kind of applications under one type of algorithm that can cover all of them? Okay. That's what we mean by flexible. Okay, and then, um, so we want to develop a class of algorithms that can be tuned depending on the applications. All right, and the robust, this is with respect to errors and noise and potential asynchronicity, which we're not gonna talk about. So it's gonna be mostly on errors and errors in communication and also computation. What if I can't get exact gradient? I can use the stochastic version of the gradient. Uh, what if my packet gets lost in the communication? I only have a noise estimate of what my neighbor told. All right, so, so that's why I have these uh, two words, flexible and robust. And in terms of uh, flexible, so we are going to develop algorithms that are flexible and robust. Okay, and the previous method that we looked at all had very specific form, right? It either looks like you're doing one or two minimization per step, or you're taking a gradient step. So there, there's not much flexibility. I give you the algorithm, we implemented that at the end of the story. But what I want to do is to tell you there's this whole other class of method that can be tuned based on the applications, okay? And then uh, also I want to advocate for a new cost framework. So not only when we see read the optimization paper on the simulation part, there's a plot of uh, algorithm performance over uh, number of iterations. So I want to say maybe number of iterations, not all that we care about, but rather the true cost, depending on the application, okay? So, so I want to evaluate the algorithm in some combination of communication and computation. And uh, uh, we're still expanding this cost framework to also increase memory, include memory access and potentially privacy issues there. But so, so far, we're just talking about communication and computation, okay? And also we want to give convergence guarantees, okay. All right. So let me start developing my methods and tell you what's gonna happen, right? So we're gonna also stick with augmented Lagrangian. So I will tell you two classes of methods we developed. The first class is gonna be based on augmented Lagrangian, okay? So the one related to ADMN where you run minimization per step, right? So the augmented Lagrangian, this is the usual form, the regular Lagrangian plus a quadratic term. Okay, so lambda is the uh, Lagrangian, the Lagrange multiplier and it's related to uh, one lambda ij per edge, okay? And then we're going to have this B matrix, which uh, is going to share the same null space as A and it's part of the semi-definite. So for our purposes, we can just think about B as A squared um, or A transpose A. Um, and it can be other versions such as a weighted graph Laplace. And so we, we kept it in a general notation in case you want to change what this B represents. Okay, so once we have the augmented Lagrangian, there is a pretty straightforward way to solve the problem that's taking gradient steps like we have seen in distributed gradient design, right? So you can take a gradient step and uh, in the primal and followed by a gradient step in the dual. So that's these updates here on top. 
So the blue one is the primal gradient update, the red one is the dual update. Okay, so you can do that. That will, so th this is the classic method that you can show convergence once you are careful with the step size choices. And different choices of matrix B, A and B lead to uh, different uh, well-known algorithms such as X and B gain. Okay, so these methods are nice. They're easy to implement because you only need a gradient and uh, you can show them to have nice convergence guarantees, but they are slow, right? So this is the same problem as what we had with the distributed gradient design. It takes a gradient, it's easy to implement, but it's slow, okay? Now, uh, ADMM type of method where a minimization is required per step, these are much faster methods, okay? But they are harder to implement. Now, here's where we come in. Remember, we want to have a, a class of flexible methods, right? So we're like, well, what if we don't stick to the formula of one gradient primal, one gradient dual, or minimize primal and one dual, but somewhere in between, okay? What if we do multiple primal updates before we take a dual update? So we kind of are, um, imagine these are two endpoints with one gradient and uh, the other end is the minimization, and we want to break bridge the gap between these two. Okay? We want to have a family of algorithms, again, depending on the application need, to pick where uh, our methods lie. Okay? So question number one, does having multiple uh, primal updates help the performance? Okay? So we, there's not a, before this work, there's not a general guarantee to say, hey, you can just come in and run any number of primal methods primal steps and we can guarantee convergence, okay? So, so this is one of the main contribution here is we came up with a set of algorithms and we said, for any number of primal updates, I can guarantee you convergence, okay? So now you do, the previous literature mostly have the form of, you have to run it many times, the, uh, the primal updates, until you hit certain precision on the primal part, okay? So we got rid of that requirement. You, you no longer have to check for uh, if you reach that precision or not. Okay. Um, now problem number two is if you look at this update right here, you need to get the gradient, right? And you also need to talk, get compute this BX. And this BX term requires communication with neighbors. Now remember we said there are different needs of the algorithm. Sometimes you can do communication, other times you can do computation. So is it necessary to recompute the gradient and or recommunicate with neighbors at every iteration, right? So it turns out the answer is no to both of these questions. And that's why I'm gonna introduce you uh, to our uh, flex PD framework, for Flexible Primal Dual Method. Okay, so here's the algorithm. We said instead of running uh, one primal update followed by one dual update, let's first talk about the first line here, the flux PDF. We are going to run T inner iterations per uh, dual update. Okay, so you can pick T to be any number, one, two, three, four. Okay, um, and we are just, this F uh, version of the algorithm is the full version where we recompute gradient, re-update the communication at every step, okay? So essentially it says instead of doing one gradient, uh, one primal, one dual, or arg mean, I can do any number of primal in between, okay? And then this uh, flex PDC version is to say, maybe cost, uh, maybe gradient computation is costly, I'm just going to recommunicate at every iteration, okay? So I will recompute this B term, BX term, remember that involves communicating with neighbors, okay? And then I'm going to use my old gradient. Okay, so I will keep my gradient step here at the previous iteration value. Okay, and similarly, I have a G version of the algorithm where gradient update is cheap. So I will update the gradient at every inner loop and keep using the old communicated value. Okay, and turns out we can guarantee convergence for any number of T for any version of this method, um, flux PDF or C or G, okay? And more importantly, this can be done in a distributed fashion. Let me just show you real quick what uh, each of these agents would do in this update. So at each of the inner update, it'll take a gradient step, and this is the dual, uh, so average getting the value of the dual variable in its neighborhood. Remember these lambdas are related to one per edge. So it only needs the lambda in its neighborhood. 
And then this B term is related to um, getting a weighted average of its neighbors. Okay, so this is the uh, F version. So I would be hearing from everyone in the neighbor and can recomputing my gradient as well. Okay, so once you finish recomputing the primal update, you send, uh, you repeat that T times and you send the update to the uh, neighbors, then you can update the dual. And then we have a version for the C update, which the gradient is old, but the communication is redone at every step. And then another G version, which uh, once again, the gradient is updated, but not the communication terms. Okay, so, so that's one class of method we developed, it's called the FlexPD. Uh, so it's, we get the, the power to run any number of uh, inner iteration or number of primal updates per dual update, and you can choose to update either the communication and or the computation, okay? And then another class of method, which we call near DGD, this is motivated by the distributed gradient descent DGD, and, uh, and that's why we call it near DGD is related. So um, remember the DGD has a very pr specific prescribed form. It has a uh, mixing with neighbors, then subtract a gradient, right? So that was one update. Well, we wanted the method to be flexible. So what we end up doing is to decompose the weighting average, because that's a step and taking a gradient descent, the, the computation step. Okay, so uh, we call, so the first one here is the communication step. This one here is the computation step. So we decompose these two steps. And then we can pick a number of uh, consensus steps to run every iteration. And recently we also had the paper publishing out to say we can also pick a number of gradient steps to run um, per iteration. So we give you a formula on how to choose these two values so that we can still guarantee convergence. So essentially you can just run uh, any number of, uh, well you can run a number of uh, consensus steps before you take a gradient. And then you can take a bunch of gradient steps before you run, come back to consensus. And uh, if you use our formula, you can still guarantee convergence, okay? All right, so, so remember, so that means the method is flexible. And remember, we also want it to be robust, right? So here's, I'm gonna introduce the, the arrows, right? So instead of the usual gradient, I'm going to take a stochastic gradient. Instead of the usual communication, I'm gonna get an arrow, it's an, 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 sorry, we're gonna get a noisy version from the neighbors. Okay, and then, I will move on as usual, right? So when I get the noisy gradient, I will just take a stochastic gradient, not surprising. You might think this whole thing is uh, going according to what you would think, right? So the gradient part, yes, we were not too surprised. You can just tolerate noisy gradient and be fine. Now the communication part was a, a real surprise for us. So remember the um, previous slide says the X so the communication step is essentially taking a weighted average with neighbors, right? So now let's just do the same thing. So Q here is a, uh, we use Q because we're working about quantization. So it's an error uh, estimate of the true uh, X. So we're just thinking, why don't we just use the, the error version and take a weighted average as usual? So that's naive attempt one, okay? And turns out it did not work very well. Okay, I'll show you uh, how bad it is later. And then naive attempt two is to say, well, it doesn't make sense that I'm taking weighted average of a noisy term, including myself, right? Because I know exactly what my value is. Why should I use a quantized version for my own value? So let's just do quantized version for everyone else around me, but use my own value um, for, for my update. Okay, so that's the second one. So WII is the self uh, update. So I'm going to use the exact value for local I. Turns out that did not work very well either. <laughs> okay, and then uh, finally we are at the last update. So this is uh, similar to the first update, except we have this error correction. So as soon as we added this error correction, which corrects for the distance between xi and it's the quantized version of qi. As soon as we do this, the method converges beautifully. Okay, not, not just our method, all the other methods we try converges beautifully. Okay, so um, very quickly, I'm almost out of time. Let me just tell you all these methods that I've shown you converges. Uh, so the FlexPD without noise converges linearly, the F version, the G version, or the C version. We all get this Q linear convergence. Okay, and then the, uh, the stochastic uh, near DGD 
converges linearly to an error neighborhood, and this error neighborhood has uh, two terms. So, so the first C1 is the linear rate, and then the, the red term here is uh, related to the network topology. This beta 2 is related to the uh, log second largest eigenvalue of the graph of Plotkin. And then the blue term there is related to the stochastic noise, and this scales with the network size. So, um, uh, one thing that I'd like to point out here is in our analysis, there's this uh, parameter phi, which, uh, which we can get rid of, and it gives us a trade-off between convergence neighborhood and the rate. So if we push uh, phi to zero, then the term in green and the blue approaches centralized the stochastic gradient descent, so that's nice. Uh, but this C2 term blows up, so the, the red term uh, blows up. Uh, is there a chat message coming in? Yes, uh, one of our colleagues might have a question. Predrag, you have a question? I tried to ask a question, but then the, the thing muted me, uh, so now it's okay. So I had a question, um, uh, Armin, a uh, few slides back. Uh, can you okay. elaborate on the, on the update that works? What's the intuition? <laughs> you mean the, the noisy update here, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we don't really have a strong intuition. This, this still bothers us that we can't explain why this particular form works. Um, mm. So, okay, I can tell you the, uh, the, uh, the, the epsilon delta based uh, uh, proof, right? So this one will give you a smaller error neighborhood for our method. What's weird about these different updates is that, so for our method, they, they more or less all work, except the last one gives you a very tight uh, error neighborhood. But what's weird is for methods like extra, and I will show, if time allows, I'll show you the picture. It blows mm -hmm. up. The error in communication accumulates. So mm -hmm. uh, the intuition, the best that I have so far, is because of this error correction term here, uh, it helps to prevent this error from accumulating, right? So we can think about the worst case scenario is you inject some noise every iteration. And even though it's zero mean, I, I probably should say that it's, the noises are zero mean, have bounded variance. Even though it's zero mean, but the variance is there and it kind of accumulates. So as far as analysis is concerned, we cannot get rid of it. And turns out in simulation, we do observe this uh, error term accumulate and the method just diverges. So, so this so, error but, correction so, but, yeah. gets, mm -hmm. but gets that, rid just, of that effect. Yeah, but like this error correction, you're just taking the last value for j minus 1, and you're subtracting the current value quantized for the, uh, is that what you do? Oh, no, no, no. So sorry, the index might be confusing. So this qj here is with uh -huh. uh, xj minus 1. So these are same same iteration. Okay. So because, X, yeah. this error correction is exactly the so Q the second term Q is the quantized version of the first term. So there, oh. there's not not a mismatch of the iterations. Yeah, that would be uh, okay. weird. Uh, it's just our yeah. labeling. We have a lot of indices here. Sorry about that. Yeah. So it's okay. the same iteration. It's just the exact value minus the error value. And since oh, okay. um, every agent is doing that, then and also W is nice. Uh, stochastic, so adds up to one. I think it somehow cancels out the error. Uh huh. And what's what is the weight? You don't use the weight, the same weight that you, you don't use WII. No, it's one. So just one in front. Okay. okay. Also weird uh, about it. Again, I think this is coming uh, from because this arrow enters into all the other agents, and the com uh, combined weight in the entire neighborhood is one. So we correct it here. Uh -huh. okay. Yeah, that's my hand waving explanation. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. all right. Uh, let you. me show you the picture. That might be helpful if that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so we we're just talking about the trade-offs here. Uh, I think it's okay. So you get the idea. There is a parameter that you can either be fast but to a worse error neighborhood or can be precise to a smaller neighborhood but be slower. And we can get it to do both things good. Okay, so let me just show you a picture real quick here. This is, uh, this is logistic regression, regularized, and uh, we train it on the uh, 
diabetic uh, data set. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and you can see here, so these three graphs are all the same methods, but um, over different uh, axes. So one is over number of iterations, one is over communication, one is over gradient evaluation. So remember our guarantee for the flex PD method is it can work for any uh, number of updates. So we tried one, two, three, and it turns out from one to two, there's a significant improvement and then it kind of diminishes. So, you know, if you ask me what T should I use, I say two. Okay. And uh, if we have more time, we can come back and interpret these. But I do really want to show you this one. I think it's related to the question earlier. This is a little bit hard to see. So I want to draw your attention to the one on the left. And uh, the, uh, this is the as near DGD with quantization. And the quantization error is on the order of uh, 10 to the minus 3. So now the two, uh, the, the gray and the red ones on top, are digging an extra. So these uh, using version two and three, these are the naive attempts one and two, the, the two, the two um, without error correction. So if you do that, for our method, we are okay, we don't blow up, we just go to the worst neighborhood, but for, uh, for extra and digging, they uh, really blow up pretty badly. So you can clearly see the error accumulates there. Okay, and then uh, so the V1 here is what we end up using with error correction. V2 is uh, just a linear combination of errors. Sorry, linear combination of quantized version. V3 is the linear combination of uh, uh, quantized for neighbors plus exact if you are using the self update. Okay, so this one shows you something weird about these different ways of running uh, using quantization. And we thought when we started the project, it's just going to be plug and play. You just have a quantized version, you plug it in, and it's going to work. But it turns out that's not the case. You have to be very careful in how you quantize it. Okay, and uh, uh, my time is up. So let me just wrap things up. So I presented a flexible and a robust distributed optimization framework, and uh, we can accommodate different hardware capabilities and we're working on accommodate second order and putting neural networks in the picture as well. Um, and we provide convergence guarantees and I have listed a few other ongoing directions, but my time is up so I will stop here and uh, be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ermin. Uh, let's uh, give her a virtual round of applause. Uh, and uh... Bravo. So um, at this point, we can open the floor for questions uh, in, in, in this interest of, uh, I guess, avoiding uh, some sort of a mayhem. We can perhaps uh, uh, type if you have a question and I can ask one by one to unmute yourself and, and go ahead. So anyone wants to jump in? Okay, Salim, please go ahead. Yeah, first, thank you for the interesting talk. Uh, I have a very quick question because I'm not in the field. Uh, you mentioned uh, you talked about SGD and ADMM. Uh, do we? You mentioned, if I understood correctly, you said that ADMM is faster. Do do we know uh, convergence result in terms of, of of convergence rate? Is it better or in general? And if you have some implementation numbers, like if you implement SGD versus ADMM, do you know how fast it is? So it, it really depends on the problem and how well tuned these methods are, and ADMM is very, very sensitive to uh, tuning of the step size. Uh, so uh, assuming you're, so I worked in the convex case, and I know people who looked in the non-convex case for ADMM as well. So in convex case, the guarantee, in theory, ADMM converges for any step size, whereas SGD, there is a region of step size where it converges. Okay, so that's the, the one difference uh, in theory. Now in practice, that's a different story. And they converge um, so I'm sorry, the how about the convergence rate? How about the convergence rate? The convergence rate, okay, so if they are both, so if the problem is convex, then ADMM converges with rate one over K, or one over T, the iteration count, and uh, the uh, stochastic gradient descent, uh, again, it depends on if you accelerate it or not, uh, if it goes to one over square root of T. So rate-wise, okay. ADMM is better. But, in our, but uh, again, it's very sensitive to tuning of the step size. Mm. So in practice, if you tune the step size right, then ADMM can be good. But SGD is somehow a safer option because uh, there's a wider range of okay step sizes. Okay. 
And also ADMM is sensitive to noise, right? So SGD, the main thing people want these days is you only have a noisy gradient. You don't want to do exact minimization. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, anyone else with a question? Uh, yeah, I have a question. So uh, I want to ask like about your method, the back when Predrak asked you, uh, is it that related to heavy ball methods? Is it like from where the intuition comes? Because I, uh, you're talking like, about the error correction, right? Yeah. So when I saw it for the first sight, like I said, it reminds me heavy ball methods, right? Heavy ball methods. Okay. So this is not, I, I don't have any momentum term whatsoever here. Uh, I just have a gradient, simple gradient step there. And the error correction term is somewhat related, but as I pointed out, it's probably, again, our notation's fault, that these xj minus one qj, they're at the same iteration, not from the previous iteration. It's just the current iteration's exact value minus current iteration's quantized value. So there is no history related to that. But whether you can get a heavy ball version of this method work is uh, actually an interesting question. And my guess is heavy ball is pretty sensitive uh, to noise and it may not work. But I don't know, I have not experimented with that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Well, while I let people think about it, I have a question about actually the, the very same slide. It's good we are there. Uh, okay. In the beginning, you mentioned that um, these results can be extended to n-dimensional space. So uh, I guess, what uh, does this quantization correction work even in higher dimensions then also? Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah, the, the paper, original paper is written for higher dimension. You just, okay. you still take this element by element difference between the quantized value and the original value. And, and so there, so if there is an analysis, the analysis doesn't shed any light on like what is the role of this uh, QIJK? Like, I mean, I, so, I intuitively I agree that it is, uh, it is doing what you said, which is that you are pumping no noise to your neighbors and at some level, you're also trying to subtract that noise, you know, so, but still uh, does the analysis not shed more light? So the, what, the analysis, I mean, at least the way we did the analysis has lots of norms everywhere, right? So once you throw the norms, it's the variance that pops up, even though here, uh, like the intuition says it's just the direction because we're injecting noise and then we're taking out the noise. But once we throw, throw the norms in, once we square things, it, it kind of just the variance part is left there. And we, at least so far, we have not been able to get more cleaner intuition on this. But if you guys have ideas, I'd be very happy to hear about them. Okay, thank you. Well, if I, I don't see any uh, anyone asking any more questions, uh, I, I guess Anand wrote his questions were already asked. So let's just, uh, I'd like to thank Ermin once again uh, for the wonderful talk uh, and, uh, uh, you know, we well, we can do a virtual round of applause again uh, because I guess in our department that the tradition is two, two time claps. So uh, we're just trying to keep the tradition alive. And uh, with that, uh, uh, thank you everyone for joining. We'll end the seminar here.